I know how to do things that are more popular. Like, I, I mean, I know if I want my YouTube channel to be bigger, all right. I have to do is right. start talking about gear and putting gear yes. in the title. Because most people who watch YouTube channel are beginner photographers and they're looking right. for two things. They want quick tips to make their photography better and they want to yeah. know which cameras and lenses they should buy. The thing is, is Instagram isn't actually for photographers. They made it so that okay. anybody can share images with each other about just what they're doing in their day. So like, right. that's why you're going to get photographs of people's puppies and their lunches and the dress that they're wearing. I've had street photographers tell me that my work isn't really street photography and I know what they mean. I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm being a lot more playful and light and shadow of my subjects rather than human beings. Like somebody like Ray Metzger or Fan Ho played with the same stuff. So right. for me, their work kind of gave me permission to do exactly. the same thing and call it that. But it, the definition is less important to me. It's just that's the stuff I like to shoot and see in the world. So that's what I shoot. There will come a barrage of like prompt photographers now. Yeah, well, <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, already you're going to get attacked for calling them prompt photographers. Because they're like, do you know what I mean? Like, what can I do? <laughs> who gets the credit for AI? It's not really I... the person who puts the prompt in. It's the program. It, it, it's, it's the example I heard was it's like going it's like me going into the city near me, York, and seeing like a street artist who's sketching and sit down and say, draw me, draw me the cathedral with me standing in front of it. And he sits there and he draws the cathedral, me going home going, look what I made. I'm like, you didn't make that. The guy sitting on the street drew it and you took it. You just right. told him what to draw. So I think that's going to be an interesting thing as well. How much credit from you, can you take from something mm. that's made by a program? How are you doing, mate? Yeah, I'm good, and you? I'm doing wonderful. I'm doing wonderful. So, first of all, thank you so much for doing this. Oh, it welcome. really means a lot to me. Yeah, and no I've been, I've been watching your videos for like so long now, <laughs> cool. and finally, I got, I got a chance to talk to you. It really means a lot to me. Ah, oh, no, you're welcome, man. Cool. Thanks for having yes. me. No problem. No problem. So, uh, basically, I want to start the podcast with with a quotation of yours. I mean, uh, this is a piece from your book, and I want to read it loud. So here it goes. Artists make a common mistake, especially when starting out of thinking that individual style or creative voice comes from our chosen technique or the tools we choose to use. We have to avoid wasting too much time on these things and get to the bigger questions as early on in our creative journeys as we can. Otherwise, we are in real danger of getting stuck, majoring on minors. First of all, that's a these are like lovely lines. Okay, but my question to you is that what exactly are those bigger questions that you talk about? Um, I mean, I, I unpack it a lot in the book, so there's a lot there, there's a lot that I probably couldn't summarize now, but I think it's more to do with what do you want to say? Because what, what you want to say isn't dependent on which camera you happen to pick up, right? It's, I mean, in the book, I use the example that I think, um, Vivian Mayer's work would have looked like her work, whether she picked up a Roliflex or a 35 mil or something else. What she decided to take photographs of would have been the same throughout. There would have been slight changes in the way that she presented it, but that wouldn't have changed the content. And I think too many of us are trying to work out what should I use that would maybe do some of the work and make my images look good for me so that I could get popular but there's nothing really in it. There's no message in it. There's no personality in it. There's none of you in it. It's just almost like a little bit cynical about trying to work out how can I make popular looking work? Um, right. Instead of starting with what do I want to say, who am I, what's my worldview, what do I care about, what's my personality, where do I live in the world, what things do I think need addressing, like those things will make you a better photographer with more to say and whether you choose to use a 35 mil or a 50 mil, for example, like there's deeper questions in terms of what body of work you want to make. If, if you're serious about using photography as communication and actually trying to say something with it, which maybe you're not, maybe you just want to make something that, that kind of looks nice because you like the attention on something like Instagram. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But I right. think at some point you'll, you'll maybe even get the attention you want on Instagram. You'll go, I don't care about my own work. It doesn't mean anything. That's that midpoint where you start going, I've done all this, but it doesn't really mean anything. You get frustrated and you'll, you'll right. want to dig a bit deeper. Hmm. But, but why do you think that happens with, with young aspiring photographers, especially that they start chasing the latest trends and all. And, you know, is it, is it very hard? 
is that ha- does that happen because it, it's very hard to you know yeah get to get well, to a point to understand who you are basically i think it happens because it should happen i think it's right that it happens that way you know the first the first half of any journey is is all about like building your skills and trying to work out what gear you need in your hand and trying to get a handle on the technical side of photography everyone begins there i began there that's where we should begin i think it's good um right. there's nothing wrong with that and i don't think we should look down on photographers who are in that stage and i think they should not try and rush it they should try to do it well because all those tricks you teach yourself in that first half you'll use in the second half when you start to move through to the deeper stuff so take your time with it build your skills work out what gear you need buy the gear you can afford i would say don't kill yourself right. and break the bank because the spending you know d- more money than you can afford on one particular lens what you're quickly going to realize is you're going to go out and get a loan for this lens and get it and you can still take bad images on that amazing lens it's not the magic thing that you think it is so right. get something that's good enough for what you can afford and then spend your time and energy on trying to make better images of what you have that'll teach you a lot more than trying right. to spend money you don't have on gear you don't need but other than that take your time you know watch the tutorials learn the tricks learn how to use the gear and get the right gear for what you want to do that you can afford it, it's all right. good stuff in that first half but you right. will hit a point where you've learned enough technical stuff that you're like yeah but i've learned all this technical stuff i still feel like my work doesn't mean anything that's the time where you're going to have to start to dig a bit deeper but there's nothing wrong with either part of that it's all it's all necessary you know it's all good right but but when do you think that time comes in a in a photographer's life when the gears start to make like you know when one has to understand that gear is more important now when do you think that that well, time comes in a photographer's life i think you'll start by thinking the gear is important everyone begins right. there they think because they look at better photographers and they go oh they make great work because he has the new 50 mil 1.2 lens that's why it looks so right. great but right. that's not really it so that we'll we'll all begin because i think beginners also like quick wins right we like to feel right. like we're making progress fast so we feel like if we learn a trick on a tutorial it will make our images look better faster technically speaking right. and will impress other beginners Uh, right. or by that lens and i can really shallow the depth of field and most lenses can't do that so that'll impress other beginners it won't impress professionals mm. but impress other right. beginners um yeah. that's all that's all fine but like but and, and there's no timetable for when that starts to change i think i think some people stay a beginner in those sort of terms their whole lives because they don't right. really ever feel like they want to build more meaning into their work and they're happy so who cares right that's that's good for them yeah. there's no there's no need to move through to deeper work but i think right. a lot of photographers it naturally happens at some point um right. where where you haven't really got the responses to your work that you want and you get fed up of your own tricks right like right. if you posted you know 500 images to instagram with with center composed portraits at 1.2 with a super shallow depth of field and all the comments are years later still like, i love the depth of field i love the bokeh on this it's like no one's paying right. attention to the face Do you know what I mean? Right. Then you suddenly realize it's not it's not the technique. I need to build more meaning into this. Let me bring mm. back some of that depth of field and start right. focusing on the face and get people to look at what I want because they're mm. almost giving compliments to the gear, what the gear can be rather than my skill as a skill of as a photographer. And you'll get right. fed up and you'll want to start to to draw people's attention to what you intend, not mm. just showing off that you could afford a, a fancy lens, you know? Right, right, right. I understand. So you know i want to i want to ask you about about your life like what has your life like has been before getting into photography and i want to understand what really compelled you to get into photography was it a one off chance when you decided that okay now i you know wanted to do photography and i want to get into it or or has there been a chain of events you know that really pushed you towards this creative field uh, in a gradual manner what has been the case with you I, I always took photographs uh, even as a right. kid like I used to I used to go around taking photos uh, and it always interested me it was something I enjoyed doing and then I went to work for the church for uh, in South Africa for a good 10 years more even even more than that um mm. and while I was doing that I was doing little bits of photography and especially video on the side of church work because it didn't really pay very much salary so i needed right. to make a bit of extra money to make sure rent was covered and everything else and then when i lost that job with the church i decided i wasn't going back uh we i was moving in a different direction 
Right. And that was when a friend of mine said to me, well, you might as well, if you've got to start from scratch with something, you might as well pick something that you enjoy doing and see, see if you can make it a job. So I was 29, 30 years old, something like that. Um, and I've been doing a bit on the side, but not full time. And then I decided, okay, now I'm going to try and make this my job, make it pay the bills. Right. And then for the next three years, I, I, I failed. Like I, I, I waited tables for three years, 30, 31, mm. 32, 33, because I couldn't, I, I didn't know how to make it work. It took a long time. Right. And that was my main source of income. But on the side, I was still doing the photography, trying to work for people for free, build up a portfolio, go after work. And then slowly things started to click. Um, mm. And then I worked for companies full time for a while as a product photographer and food photographer, those kind of things. And then slowly right. managed to move over to my own thing. But it, it took a long time. It does take a long time. And I think it's, it's probably a good thing for beginners to know because I think, you know, people start out with aspirations of, I want to be a professional photographer. Right. That's a harder and harder thing to do. And if it's not right. happening for you, it doesn't mean you're bad. It just means the world isn't fair and it's very, very difficult to do. And it took right. me a long time. So it'll probably take anybody a long time. So just do something else as a job, do it on the side and keep plugging away and see if you can make it happen. But you know, give, right. be patient with yourself. Be patient with it. Don't, don't bully yourself because you feel it's not happening fast enough. Right, right. And before coming on to like before getting into photography, ha have you like also tried some other avenues as well, other than photography? Yeah, creatively. I'm, I'm I, yeah, creatively. I'm talking. Yeah, about. yeah. I, I did a lot of different things. I um, I uh, was a musician for years in bands. Um, okay. And uh, obviously, like I consider the, I did a lot of public speaking for the church and with with youth and young adults and that kind of thing. I I consider that a very creative pursuit as well, being able to write a talk and deliver it live um i really enjoyed that side of things yeah then there's the photography and the video and and i did write a book years ago as well before this last okay. one that came out um mm -hmm. so writing was always a thing as well i've always had these like things on the side or things that i did as jobs or just to supplement jobs that were creative outputs mm -hmm. and i'm always trying to learn new ones i feel like to i don't want to put all my eggs in one basket i want to try a bunch right. of different things with with the one lifetime i've got and like see what i can see what I can build as skill sets all over the place. And, and, and what exactly is the role of your family? Like how they influenced you to, to have this creative mind or, you know, to have this creative outlook towards life. Um, was there I mean, anybody my, in your, was there anybody in your family who was creative or who was like yeah. a creative person? My, my grandfather and my mother were both okay. um, musicians in their own way. Right. So uh, my grandfather was a semi-professional uh, opera singer and uh, my mom w went to Birmingham School of Music and played piano and sang as well. So I think, I think there's, if there's a creative thread that runs through my family, it's probably from them. Um, right. And my dad was a bass player in, in some bands in, in his 20s as well. So there's definitely something. None of them ever went on to do it as a job, really. It was just something they did on the side. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I think I've taken it a bit further than they took it, but but if there is an influence, it's probably those three: my mom, my dad, in different ways, and then my grandfather. And has they always supported you in your creative pursuits? Like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, my dad left when I was quite young, so so he he didn't have a lot to do with my life until quite recently, okay. where we've kind of reconnected. But mm -hmm. uh, my mom, yeah, she was fairly supportive. I think. I mean, she honestly like. I, I left home quite young and sort of went off and did my own thing. I felt like okay. so my relationship to my family for a lot of the time was quite was quite estranged or I was running off and doing my thing. But like it's been nice in the last few years. My mom my mom read the meaning in the making uh, the book, right. and I think that was a that was an interesting moment for her. She kind of uh, she 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 sat down with me. She's like, oh, it's very clever. It's very clever. You know that was her response. But like I think there's like. Right. There was something about it's got to be strange when your kids leave home and they go off and do their right. own thing and then you get something that they've made and you have to interact with them and they're not your child anymore they're an adult out in the world doing their thing so i think she had a right. bit of a moment with that that was quite interesting yeah but they've right yeah she's been very supportive right right and and how has been your childhood like like have you have you been an introverted person mm. yeah my personality is definitely introverted so when my when my dad left home i was probably four years old and I was okay. already quite shy I think a little bit shy but when he left home I completely closed up as a kid and just hmm. 
became very very shy so for my whole schooling year i was i was the kid at the back of the class who never spoke i was very very okay. quiet um and then i think because we as a family we moved around a lot we right. never lived anywhere for longer than about three years so it was always having to move somewhere start again meet new people which as a shy child was quite difficult to do um mm -hmm. you know i was always moving schools and moving home and having to begin again with a new group of friends so that became quite a challenge but i think what it did for me is it taught me beyond my personality if i wanted to survive i needed to be, become better at uh, adapting and being a bit more versatile and resilient when i moved somewhere and, and know how to fit in with a new group of people even as someone who's maybe quieter so it I, taught me a lot about who i am and how i relate to other people which was good hmm. so I, I don't think of myself as a as a shy introvert anymore i think i'm a fairly confident right. introvert but i'm still definitely somebody who needs to take space to recharge rather than be around other people mm, right i understand and i ask this question to like uh to everybody i talk to because somehow i personally feel that i'm also you know a similar kind of a person yeah i am an introverted person and and i really find it very hard to gel up with people that easily yeah yeah so yeah i can how understand does, how does I it work for you how does it work for you i mean earlier I used to just run away from people, uh -huh. but then gradually and you know uh, slowly, I I I I tried meeting new people. Yeah. You know, and first of all, photography has literally helped me. Like, yeah. I yeah, because I understand that you know from behind that viewfinder, I yeah. can really hide myself and I can shoot pictures and I can create something without getting into you know people and without you know getting into the crowd. Mm. So that has really helped me. That's interesting. Yeah, you're almost like around people, right? So you're in that That's space with them, but you're not having to put yourself in the middle of it and directly right. interact. That's interesting. Yeah, right. And then you know, books has really helped me. Uh huh. Especially philosophy, psychology books. I'm really interested right. in all those things. So that has really literally helped me. That's so great. Yeah. That has been the case with me. So I want to understand when you say that you have been an introverted person, and just if i if i look at your work especially yeah. your youtube videos and your photography as well you see we are living in a world where everybody where everybody literally everybody seem to you know hop on to the latest trends and strategies mm. in a world where people are like this around you how do you manage yourself to be so you know true to your own calling like mm. do you do like are there any any deliberate efforts that you have to make on a regular basis Mm -hmm. do you feel do you feel distracted at times or or have you made yourself immune to all these things in 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 a while so how does how does that happen for you I, I mean i'm not i'm not immune to it like obviously the temptation was always there from the beginning i i know how to do things that are more popular like i, I mean i know if i want my youtube channel to be bigger all right. i have to do is right. start talking about gear and putting gear yes. in the title because most people who watch youtube channel are beginner photographers and they're looking right. for two things they want quick tips to make their photography better and they want to yeah. know which cameras and lenses they should buy so if you right. want your youtube channel to grow free and free advice those two things that's that's the best chance you have of getting views on your videos but I, I just made a decision at the start where I was like, I, I want to make the kind of channel that I would want to watch at my stage. And I know that I'm not a beginner anymore. I'm an intermediate right. photographer working as a professional. So I'm further down the road asking different questions. Hmm. So I knew that if I made a channel for people where I was talking about, and it's not that I don't do tutorials, I do, but it's, it's if I'm making a channel with videos that talk more about the meaning in your photography, that's right. a second half of your journey question. And most right. photographers don't get there. So I'm mm. making it for a much smaller group of people. But I knew if mm. I did that, I would like the work forever. And mm. if I just made tutorials for beginners, I wouldn't be as interested. And I'd, I know, I'd know that I wasn't giving what I'm best at giving. And it was, it was right. an easy choice. I read, a, I read an article years ago um, called A Thousand True Fans by Kevin Kelly. And he sort of right. talks about, yeah. He and you have mentioned about it in, your, in one of your videos yes. as well. Right. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, and it's in the book as well. And it's it's he mentions that, um, you know, any artist can make a living with a thousand true fans. And he says mm. that a true fan is somebody who will come to your workshop or buy a print or buy something from you or come out to a talk you give. And that kind of stuck in my head. Like I don't need this massive subscriber number. I right. just need at the core of that following. I need 
a thousand people who really care. That's it. So right. I never really concerned myself with how big it was getting. I concerned mm. myself with how big that core was who were really following along and the rest I didn't really care about because I know how YouTube works. Most people come and they watch a video of yours because you're teaching them how to take a portrait with one speed light and then they disappear and they forget about you straight away. They've got right. the information they need, which is fine. I mean, that's why I give mm. it to people because I want them to have the information. So I'm not upset about that at all, but I'm not right. making the channel for that person. I'm making mm. the channel for that that group that watch every video, that especially mm. watch my philosophical playlist because I know they're my people. They're the ones who are asking that second half of your journey questions about meaning and about right. what are you pointing the camera at, why are you doing what do you want to say, that stuff. So uh, right. Right. I, for me, it's a survival thing. I think I would, I don't think I'd still be doing it if I was just making okay. tutorials. I think I would have got fed up with myself and been like, I don't mm. really like what I'm doing, but I still love it now like I loved it at the beginning because I'm right. doing exactly what I want to do that makes me excited. What you want to do. And it, right. it means you have longevity with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm -hmm. And but, but do you think these tips and tricks, ideas really help, like such kind of videos? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, 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 I don't look down on it at all because, I mean, I, I, I taught myself photography entirely on YouTube videos with tips and tricks videos. Like, right. so I know the value of them. Like, I, I, right. I, I learned how to use uh, lights in portraiture from Zach Arias on, on mm -hmm. YouTube, like watching him use one light uh, in various different scenarios. And he had like a big alien B 800 and a battery pack that used to take around and shoot fashion stuff. And I'm like, like that, that taught me that watching him give that technical information, helped me to go out and experiment. So yeah, it definitely works. It definitely works. And mm. now, you know, I have all that technical information in the back of my head. I don't right. use most of it. The stuff that mm. I've learned because I've chosen the 10% that's useful for what I do. Right. But I had to learn it all to work out which was the stuff I wanted to use and which wasn't. You've kind of got to put mm. everything in to work out what sticks and what helps you give yourself the visual voice that you want. It's all part of the mm. process. But yeah, I think I think we live in an amazing time now where you can jump online and you can learn. To, uh, tips, techniques, tricks from 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 people on the other side of the world for, for free. And teach yourself right. pretty much anything you want to is is a real gift. Yeah, right, right, right. And you know, when 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 we talk about like Instagram or social media for that matter, the advent of social media, especially in regard to photography, and I've always heard this that you know social media has really democratized the photography industry or any yeah. art industry for that matter. But do you think with the democratization of photography or any art form comes a lot of mediocrity as well uh -huh. on the surface? Uh -huh. Do you believe that? Well, cool. well, of course. But 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 the the thing is, is Instagram isn't actually for photographers. I think that's the okay. mistake we think is we think we think that people at Instagram made Instagram just to serve professional photographers or aspiring photographers to share their images with each other. But that's not why they made it. They made it so that okay. anybody can share images with each other about just what they're doing in their day. So like, right. that's why you're going to get photographs of people's puppies and their lunches and the dress that they're wearing or whatever it happens to be, because there's no rule on how you can use Instagram. People can use it for whatever they want. We, as photographers, right. we make a mistake that we think it's for us. It's not for us. It's for everybody. Right. And they, everyone yeah, has just, different just because Just because they are images, that doesn't mean that it is for photographers, right? Well, that's it. It's exactly. And it's, I, th I think like most, I mean, the vast majority of the stuff that gets posted is someone taking a very quick very average photograph on their phone to tell their friends right. what they're doing. That's how they use it. We know that. So I think when right. we start going, well, yeah, but it's it's watering down photography. It's, it's not really though. It's, it's, right. if you take the, the, the overall of what Instagram looks like and you think that's a representation of the art form of photography, and yeah, it's watering mm -hmm. it down, but that's not what Instagram is. Instagram's a, a very broad social media platform that gets used by everybody. What right. I would suggest people do Right. is that they get more deliberate about who they follow and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and also train the algorithm to see the work that you want to see. Because when I look at my Instagram feed, I've been very deliberate with that and I don't feel like it's watered down at all, but that's because I mm. deliberately follow good photographers. So I have a pretty mm. constant stream of great photography right. coming down my Instagram feed and I don't feel that it's watering anything down at all. I'm seeing amazing work produced by right. some of my favorites. It's how you use these things. We can't blame the platform for right. showing us something that we actually taught it to show us. That's how the algorithm works. 
if right. you're clicking on things and looking through things that are just people's lunches and puppies and girls and dresses then yeah that's what it's going to keep showing you and right. it's not it's not instagram's fault it's your fault for training it to do that if you want to see something different go through your list and unfollow the rubbish you don't want to see and and mm. focus on looking at the stuff you want to see and teach it teach it to show you right. the good Right, that's an interesting perspective. So, so I guess what you're trying to do here is that you're reverse reverse engineering the algorithm. Yes, and and using it to really you know uh, to to reach to the to, to the kind of work that you that you really want to see. Yeah, absolutely, and that's that's because we can use these tools any way we want. We know how they work by now. There's no right. mystery. Like we don't know exactly what the algorithm is, but we do right. know if we look at particular things and click at particular things, we're going to see a lot more of it. So if you right. don't want to see that, stop clicking on it, stop looking on it, unfollow it, and be more deliberate about curating your feed by looking mm. at the things you want that inspire you. And then it right. will start to fill up with that stuff because it wants to keep you on the platform. So it will show you sure. that stuff. We, right. we have more ourselves to blame for what we see on something like Instagram by teaching it that than, than the platform itself because the platform doesn't know you and doesn't care. It's, right. it's, it's Absolutely. just feeding you what you what it thinks you want to see. So teach it what you mm. want. To see. So when you say that Instagram is not the you know uh, platform for photographers, do you think there are other platforms that that photographers should like explore um, right now? I mean, I don't, I don't. Yeah, I mean, definitely explore other platforms, but I don't think anything is out there that's going to do what. I think photographers have got this idea, and I can kind of hear it in your question as well. It's like, where do you go for the pure photography online? Pure photography, right? Like, there, there, there isn't. Like there was, like. There, like there was a time that people used to, you know, use Flickr for that matter. Yeah. Flickr's good still. I think. I mean, it's still out there, still doing its thing, and there are some cool Flickr groups that you can join where they really do right. take it quite seriously and quite deliberately. You could do that. Um, right. You could try something like, I don't know if 500px is still going, you could try something right. like that. Um, you could try uh, you could try Vero because that seems to be more deliberate about just showing you the stuff that you follow rather than algorithm right. driven. So you could try something like that. Um, okay. You know, there are different options out there, but I, I, think, I think we just have to set our expectations right. There is no pure, you know, I'm just going to see great photography only because mm -hmm. anytime, anytime you follow anything, there's also right. going to be most of the people on whatever platform it is are going to be beginners who just started out because professional photographers don't use social media platforms for anything other than marketing. Sure. So the people who are going to be posting most are the beginners, which means your feed is going to quickly fill up if you let the algorithm do it with beginner right. photography, most of which is going to be rubbish. So you, 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 you know, you, had to, you just have to admit that that's what it is and be okay with that. And then just slowly train the algorithm. Take responsibility for what you're looking at and try to right. be as deliberate with it as you can in whichever platform you use. But I don't, I don't think there's any like one platform that works you know, for everything. Okay. Got it. Got it. So, so when you were like trying to get into photography or you were teaching yourself photography, what are the avenues that you used at that time to, you know, to teach yourself photography? Like, and what, 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 what? Who were the photographers that really inspired you at that time? Uh, I so, to know about that. Uh, for, for me, when I started out, it was all YouTube and blogs. I, I, I read okay. a lot of blogs as well. Blogs aren't as much of a thing now, but they, they right. were back when I was sort of teaching myself. Um, right. And the photographers that inspired me, I mean, at the start, it was photographers like portraits. Like I said, Zach Arias was big for me. Uh, okay. Gregory Heisler was also quite interesting. Uh, looking at stuff from... Steve McCurry was good from Irving Penn, from Richard Avedon. Um, and then I discovered Joey L, Joey Lawrence, who was actually a big right. deal for me, seeing his stuff in Ethiopia and in India. He did some stuff in Varanasi uh, and then did some projects in Syria as well. Like that, that was really inspirational work for me as well. And then mm -hmm. street photography was more uh, Fan Ho, Ray Metzger, uh, some of Trent Park's work with the kind of light and shadow people that I followed. Um, right. People like Joel Meyerowitz, Gary Winogrand were people who sort of taught me about including a lot of different elements in the frame and composing a wider shot. Hmm. Um, obviously looking at people like Vivian Mayer for street portraits, uh, Helen Levitt, those kind of people. Like there's, There were a lot of people I've looked at um, who who I found quite inspirational. Annie Leibovitz for portraits as well, obviously, was huge. Right. Um, yeah, so those were some of them. But yeah, it's a long list. Yeah. And are there are there any contemporary photographers that you that you like to see? 
Uh, I mean, Joey Lawrence is the biggest for me still. I think I think his his personal work more than his commercial work I find very inspirational. Mm. He's just put out a book on Ethiopia, which I think is uh, I, I really want to get a, uh, my hands on a copy, which mm. I think is a beautiful study of a of a culture. I know he married a, a woman from Ethiopia as well, so he's you know he's got a lot of that connection inside information stuff, and he's really got access to some very interesting people. Um, right. so he he's been a very uh, he's been a very uh, inspirational person for me and then i've got some friends who i find very inspiring as well so uh, in the uk here photographers who kind of really pushed me uh, my friend right. joshua jackson is is, right, a, right. is a really really like quite brilliant photographer i i always show off that i really believe he's going to be one of the greats one day i've learned a lot from hours walking around with him and shooting with him and chatting um uh, my friend josh edgoose who's spicy meatball mm -hmm. on instagram as well very interesting use of color and uh, uh, juxtaposition and humor and his stuff. Uh, right. He's fantastic. Yeah. So there's also people who like are my contemporaries who we kind of bounce right. off each other a bit as well, who I find very inspiring. But yeah. Right. 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 And 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 do you think your your kind of street photography is completely different from the kind of street photography that these people do, or yeah. do you see any similarities? Yeah. I mean, I mean, honestly, like. I've had street photographers tell me that my work isn't really street photography and I know what they mean. I'm okay with that because even though it is taken on the street, I think if you take a very narrow definition of street photography, it's like right. it's supposed to be almost reportage, like you're capturing interactions between identifiable human subjects in an urban space. And I don't really do right. that as much. I'm I'm being a lot more playful and light and shadow of my subjects rather than human beings. And if people are in the frame, it's more for a sense of scale than trying to tell a particular story about that person. So I almost shoot like a graphic designer uh, where mm -hmm. it's about shape, color and texture, uh, which I like. Right. And, and I mean, um, I, I, I think technically that is street photography. Um, mm -hmm. Like somebody like Ray Metzger or Fan Ho played with the same stuff. So right. for me, their work kind of gave me permission to do exactly. the same thing and call it that but it de the definition is less important to me it's just that's the stuff i like to shoot and see in the world so that's what i shoot you know? right right so talking about street photography what exactly is your like routine or like how do you approach street photography like do you regularly go out with your camera and yeah. shoot stuff or like how exactly you do it like yeah i mean i i uh especially if I'm visiting a city, uh, I, I, you know, I'll go out for three, four hours at a time. I've usually just got my little Ricoh GR3X. It's mm -hmm. like a little tiny pocket camera. And I like to keep it that small, just walk with that tiny pocket camera. I can be Wi-Fi images across to my phone, editing, posting, like it's all in, in my pockets. There's no right. big bag or anything like that. And I like that kind of very light, versatile way of walking around. It also makes mm -hmm. you less obvious. It doesn't, you know, um broadcast that a photographer's around doing something you know there's no big camera backpack or long lenses it's tiny pocket camera and a phone and just walk and see and you kind of you can get away with being in spaces without making yourself obvious john myowitz calls it bruising the scene you know if you stay mm -hmm. somewhere too long you bruise the scene or if you're too obvious like it helps you stay under the radar a bit more when you do travel that lightweight and shoot that lightweight so right. that kind of works for me and i tend to i tend to walk quite fast and try and walk quite far so i can see as much as i can in a time and really explore and deliberately get lost and try work my way back and because right. then you discover interesting things so i'm usually trying to avoid the touristy areas try and mm -hmm. find the interesting back streets with the with the interesting details mm -hmm. uh and yeah mostly if i'm taking the rico out it has to be good light like i don't shoot on cloudy days with that thing I'd usually right. go out with a full frame and a 50 on shallow depth of field instead. Because you've got to have a way to separate the subjects out, right? So sure, sure. I can separate subjects with a very deep depth of field if I've got light and shadow to play with and hide some things in shadow and some things in light. But on a right. flat day, I don't want a deep depth of field. I need to shallow the depth of field and separate subjects with some blur in the background and sharpness in the foreground. So I'm always right. looking for how do I separate elements out, mm -hmm. uh, so depending on the light conditions. Uh, so how, uh, how, how, how often do you get go out? Like two, do you three shoot times regularly, a week. two, three times, yeah, and, two, three and, times a week. And, okay. And when you're not out or when you're not shooting, when you're at your place inside your mm -hmm. house, what exactly, how exactly do you spend your time? What exactly do you do? Well, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm scripting and writing the videos, filming those, editing those, putting those out. I'm doing more and more documentaries with other photographers. So I'm traveling and making those documentaries with them. Filmmaking mm -hmm. 
as you probably know, it takes a long time, that kind of right. process. So uh, a good a good two out of every four weeks of the month is spent doing that. Uh, mm -hmm. Then, you know, I've got other projects on the go. I put out a couple of magazines a year at the moment. So there's writing around those and sequencing for those. Uh, writing the book took a lot of time. So there's all the other. And then, of course, all the admin, you know, all the boring I, answering a thousand emails and, you know, getting back to people and messaging. And then I do other things like uh, talks like and doing, work. Like doing and this. Yeah, well, I mean, this, you know, it's it's all part of it, you know, and I love it. I love right. it all. Don't get me wrong. There's no complaint in any of it. Like, it's it's all interesting and it all kind of builds mm -hmm. towards being able to make the work you want to make, which is great. True, true, true. And then the That's running right. retreats and workshops and stuff as well. And so there's a mix of, of things, you know, and I think it's a good thing for people to know, you know, I might be a photographer, but I don't mm -hmm. I don't do a lot of photography work for clients anymore because there's just no okay. time. So everything is taken up with a bunch of other different things that diversify the income as much as possible and my time gets diversified and in the mix of that hopefully you can build something where you can support yourself financially but you need a bit of all of it i think to keep it going there's there's this idea that if you fall in love with photography i can get a great camera walk out the street take photographs and then people will come knocking on my door saying please can we give you money so you can keep making this work it doesn't work like that you know like you have to build a lot of different things to get yourself out mm -hmm. there and and you've got it you've got to diversify that time it can't just all be you enjoying yourself out in the street with a camera there's there's work to do too right the work that you might not even like doing Sometimes I'm, I'm, I, I'm not a fan of emails. Do you know what I mean? Like right. you got to do true, it. True, true. You got to do it. Right, yeah. right. So, so basically, tell me when when you are yourself a creator, you're creating images and you're creating videos. Do you get time to consume content as well, or do you consume content deliberately? Yeah, I don't. I, I'll be honest. I don't watch a lot of photography YouTube channels because okay. I feel like I don't want their stuff in my head now because I'm doing true, the same true. thing. I don't want to know what you're doing. Hmm. I want I want everything I write and script and put out there to come from my head because right. I thought of this idea. Um, mm -hmm. I don't want to be influenced by what they're doing. So I kind of consume a lot of other stuff. Like I've got some history channels I really enjoy and some musicians I love following, those kind of things. Like I try and use consuming content as a way to explore other avenues outside of what I do and keep expanding right. my interests. Uh, yeah, but I'm quite, I, I try and be quite deliberate about it. Mm, right right and tell me how do you how do you challenge yourself like you know like art often involves that you push your boundaries and you know uh, yeah. and walk into the unknown terrains as well i mean this is a normal saying you know people a lot of people say that do you often challenge yourself creatively and if yes how do you do that yeah i mean i i i'm I'm quite hard on myself with that as well. I, I, I mean, I just I just made a video recently about sort of how my street photography has grown over the years. Mm -hmm. And one of the points I make in that video is it would be very easy for me to go, well, I'm just the guy who shoots a diagonal shadow on a wall. You know what I mean? Because right. that's what people see in my work and that's what they know and they like that, right? Mm. A few years ago, I, found, I almost found a trick that people liked, you know? But if I stop there, I stop growing, right? Right. It, it's a temptation when you do something that people seem to respond to or, or, or gel with, uh, like a way of exposing and using uh, using shadows graphically. Right. Um, I could just go, well, I've I've arrived. I've got a visual voice. This is it because people like it. But but then you you sacrifice your ability to keep uncovering your creative voice. And so sure. I, I'm very hard on myself about always always pushing that stuff aside and trying to find the new thing or the next thing by experimenting with new stuff that I'm not good at, that I'm out of my depth with so that right. I can uncover something new. And each time I find something that works for me, I get to put that in the toolbox. It never goes away. Like I can always pull it out in any city at any time, but right. I always want more tools in there. I don't just want one in there. I don't want to be known for one thing. So right. I always want to keep developing my portrait work and my street work and bringing mm -hmm. more and more variety to all that work together so so that you could drop me anywhere in the world and i could take interesting photographs no matter what the weather's like if the sun isn't out that day i should still be able to find great photographs because i'm a photographer i shouldn't right. go well sun's not out so i can't do diagonal showers on a wall well then i'm just a one trick pony right i have to push mm -hmm. myself beyond that one trick to keep developing so i'm, I'm quite deliberate about being out of my depth as often as possible and trying new things.
Right. And do you feel any challenge when it comes to street photography, especially when you know that you have, you know, a sort of introverted personality? Mm -hmm. Like, how did you how did you manage to get into photography if you have that kind of personality? How do you approach it? Well, I mean, for, for my style of street photography probably developed because of my personality. Because of that, right, yeah. right, right. Because I, I wasn't the kind of person who wanted to get in people's faces hmm. and photograph people in an identifiable way. That felt too confrontational for my personality. And so and I that started, too without any consent. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Hmm. So I started to take a step back and look at the space rather than the face. And right. when I looked at the space, I started to compose uh, interesting light in spaces and then people would walk and move through that space. But because I was there first, Right. putting a camera up and looking at a scene and someone walks through there's no confrontation they're not going to be mm. why are you taking my photograph because they know i'm not psychic i couldn't have guessed they were coming instead right, they true. go oh i'm really sorry i walked through your photograph you know what mm. i mean so you swap confrontation for an apology because you're mm. there first so i worked mm. that out quite early on and i realized like if i shoot in this more fisher than hunter mentality it right. takes that whole confrontational element out of it and you still get mm. to produce interesting images and also give some anonymity to the subjects, which in our world today, where people are quite nervous about being on camera and being mm. thrown on social media, so diffuses right. a lot of that as well. So because I'm wired the way I am, I think it led me that route. Right. And do you do you do you do you confront people on streets sometimes or you don't have that kind of approach to confront people and shoot them? Like, no, I never, I never really do. Yeah. It's not, uh, it's not what I'm after. I mean, I will sometimes take a photograph quite close to somebody if they're doing something very interesting and try and right. do it in a way that doesn't make them aware of what I'm doing because not because I'm trying to be sneaky, but because uh, I want to catch the unguarded moment. And if they right. see me taking right. a photograph, they'll change immediately. And I've lost the moment. It has to be a genuine mm. moment where I'm not noticed and they're being hundred percent themselves. So I'll do that every now and again, but it, I'll try and be, subtle about how I do it and not sort of drop right. down on my knee and bring the big camera out and to, you know, just something subtle every now and again. Right. right. And and do you think street photography sometimes hampers with the privacy of people as well? That photographers just, you know, reach out to other people and, you know, go into their uh, privacy and just click photographs. Do you think that that hampers with the privacy? I mean, it, it... <laughs> It's a hard one because it, it, there, you'll get different opinions all around the world depending on where you right. live. And there's so, different laws in different countries as well. So in the UK here, the law mm -hmm. is that if you're in a public space, you can right. be photographed. No one can stop you and you have no right to privacy if you're in a public space. That's how it works. Okay. I still try and be a little more sensitive than that and feel at the moment. Like, for example, mm -hmm. if there's a mother with two young children, I'm not going to photograph her children. There's no law against it technically in the UK. Right. You can, you can do that legally because they're in the public and space and there's no expectation of privacy. But on top of it, I'm like, I wouldn't want to make anyone feel uncomfortable in this. So I won't, I won't do that. That's a personal choice for me. I think yeah, just, that's a moral compass that you have in your, in your mind, I guess. Yeah. It's like a conscience, isn't it? Like, and, and you have to right. work out what your lines are for yourself what mm -hmm. your ethical line is. It's going to be different for some people than other people. And that's fine. True. Learn, learn the law in your country and don't cross that. And then work mm -hmm. out beyond that law. What are you okay with or not? I'm not going to photograph a homeless person. So they're recognizable. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's too, it's, it's, it's taking advantage of a, of a bad situation. Yeah, right. So for me, I won't do that. I know other mm -hmm. people who do that and they do it brilliantly. And I think they, I'm glad it is photographed because it's something we need to be talking about. But personally, for me, I don't want to do that. I just, I don't feel comfortable. So, mm. but, but when it comes to the public, I mean, if you're in public spaces, you don't have a right to privacy is, is the sad fact. You know, like right. what's the difference between a street photographer taking your photograph and a tourist who you just happen to be in the frame? Do you know what I mean? It becomes a very gray right. area that's hard to police. Right. True. I think if you're a photographer, you do need to be very careful about getting in someone's face when you take a photograph, because mm -hmm. you are probably going to make someone uncomfortable, especially men photographing women. You need to right. be very, very careful about how you're making people feel, because if you're mm. not, if you're not just a bad person, you should care how you're making someone else feel beyond just being selfish about the art you want to make. You should care True. how you move in the world as well. But that's down mm. to you. That's your decision to make. What sort of human being do you want to be on top of what sort of artist you want to be? And those are, right. those are kind of personal choices to make. Mm. I got it. I got it. So I I want to 
ask you about like from the perspective of a young photographer who is just let's say who is just starting out do you think a uh, formal training in photography helps or do you think if a person like learn everything by by himself or herself that really helps like how much importance do you think formal training in photography hold i think that this is only my because, view like i don't i don't are, swear, yeah. right because there are tons of photography courses out there like yes. people are selling their courses and all so yes. It really confuses people at times. I know, I know, I know. I, 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 this is only my personal thing, so I'm not putting this on right. anyone else. But for me, right. I don't think formal training is that helpful with photography, because. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in London, when I was a product photographer, I had two different assistants, uh, both okay. of whom went to university for three years each to study photography, and then came to work for me. And neither right. of them knew how to use their camera properly. Three years training. And I'm like, what did you guys do? And they're like, well, we learned the history of photography and we did these like cool projects on film. We went to the forest and then we developed our own whatever. But in terms of the day to day, the practical how to use the gear and take great photographs, they hadn't learned it. They hadn't been taught that. It's almost like it's taught. It's taught like an art form, but not very practically. And hmm. and I know not every institution is like that, but but they was they certainly came. That was my experience with people who are professionally trained. And I managed to teach myself everything I know from scratch online. And I think the good part about that is that because I've proved to myself I can teach myself everything I need to know, mm -hmm. I will always be able to teach myself anything because not just I've learned photography, but I've learned mm. how to teach myself huh. anything. You know what I mean? You have, le you have learned how to learn as well. Exactly, exactly. And right. I think there's, there's something really empowering about that for me. I mean, maybe mm. you get to the stage where you go, I'm not finding the information that I really need after trying to teach yourself online, I need something more specific. And there is a course that you can go on that you can really learn those specifics well in an intense situation. Then I think it's helpful. But right. in general, I, I wouldn't advise people to spend a lot of money going and doing general studies in photography for years. Because I think you can get a lot further, a lot faster, a lot cheaper on your own steam. And like we mm -hmm. said, like you teach yourself how to learn in the process. Right, right, right. And, and, and what do you think about photography workshops? I mean, some are good, some are bad, right? I mean, like it really depends. I, th I think some people are doing it because they want to make some money and some photographers really have some great information to share and you right. get your money's worth. Uh, but you really have to do your research and work out what mm. am I going to get from this, right? And right, what, right. like, look at some reviews, talk to some people who've been on those workshops. What was the value mm. of this for you? And, and what are you actually aiming for? And it's also mm. on you as the beginner photographer as well. Why are you going on that workshop? Because if you're right. just going on a workshop with a photographer and you like their work and you're just going to try and copy some tricks so you can imitate exactly what they do, you're right. shooting yourself in the foot. That's not why you should be going on a workshop. You should be going to learn how to find your own voice, not copy theirs. So there's, true, true. there's all those kind of things you have to think about. But yeah, I mean, it really, really, that one really depends on the photographer about how mm -hmm. much value and, and 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 how often do you conduct your your workshops like well i don't really do workshops anymore uh i did okay. one a few years ago i'm actually doing two next week but that's because um I, i'm doing it in partnership with wex photography okay. over here like a big photography store they've asked me to come and do them but for myself i don't do a lot of street photography or photography workshops anymore and is there any is there any particular reason for that do you, you don't like like yeah because I, the one, the one that I did a few years ago, I, I did this, I did it wrong. Basically okay. in my head, I thought, okay, I'm going to get them for two days and I want to give them a lot of value. So I right. almost killed them with PowerPoint. Do you know what I mean? I just like sat through presentations and lots of information and I'm because when they walked in the room, I had 14 people in a room. Some of them had just picked up a camera for the first time and some of them right. had been shooting for 20 years. So where right. do you pitch this information now? Because you're either going to leave half the class behind or you're going to bore no. the other half of the class. It's very, very mm. hard to pitch. So I find now that it's far better to do something a lot looser. Just go out in the street and go, listen, we've got this space. Let's go out and shoot. Come back and show me what you're doing. I'll give you some advice and, and, and make it a lot less structured and a lot more reactive. And just talk. Just have the conversations. Mm. But, you know, that's not really can't charge a lot for that right that's not you're not going home with a ton of information and maybe somebody if they don't have the confidence to say hey i want to ask you about this they might go home with nothing because it's on them mm -hmm. to ask so okay. because of all those i'm like uncomfortable about how to pitch those things i i stay away from it at the moment until i work out how to do it better which might happen 
Mm-hmm. And like, do you have any plans to visit India or like do some workshops here? I would love you visit, to visit India. Have, have you have you visited India never. like earlier? Uh, never. Never, never. I would I would absolutely love to get out to India. It's it's one of those places on my list. Yeah, it's uh, I I hope to be there sometime soon. Fingers crossed. Would be brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, it would be lovely. It would be lovely. Yeah. So okay, so uh, I want to talk to you about now uh, now about AI. What do you think is the future of photography? Keeping in mind the AI thing, because you know whenever something new comes up, whether it is AI or some new technology, we all know that we have this. There is this human tendency to fear the unknown. Okay, and then people got divided into two parts. One. on one side there are people who just completely ignore ai mm. who say that okay ai will do nothing okay yeah. and then there are people who fear ai like anything yeah 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 so how how do you find a balance and and how do you see photography the future of photography i mean i, I made a video on this a while ago and uh, i mm. basically said i'm not scared of ai right now when it comes mm. to photography i'm not really that nervous about it because you know i think the big fear that people have that i hear a lot is we won't be able to trust our eyes anymore with what we're seeing true. true but that's we haven't been able to trust our eyes for a long time like right. photoshop has been around for 30 years plus mm. and we we have been, a, a skilled photoshop operator will be able to lie with an image and you will never be able to tell right most right. almost everybody won't be able to tell so this isn't a new problem we we mm-hmm. we act like ai coming around is the first time we haven't been able to trust our eyes that's rubbish so i hear people mm-hmm. saying things like well yeah but what about news and people will be able to ai generate images and pretend it's news i'm like yeah but we could photoshop images 20 years ago and pretend they were news and fool everybody but the point is they have, no one ever gets away with it because it's very easy right. to check the facts and work around it and no reputable news outlet if they ever put a photoshopped image onto a newspaper or or onto a tv screen as part of the news and it was discovered that it was fake or photoshopped they would right. lose all credibility so they're very 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 careful and i think they will be as careful with ai to make sure that mm. it's a genuine photograph because they know what technology is out there so i'm not worried about not believing or believing what i see out there when it comes from reputable sources yes right. i have to be careful that just an image i see online i have to be careful whether it's real or not but that's been true for a long time it's not new true. you know so i'm mm. not worried about it from that point of view um mm. when it comes okay. to i mean obviously it's more accessible now uh than right. ever before so we're going to see a lot more rubbish out there but that's going to make us more discerning and make it make sure that we take more personal responsibility for working out is something i'm seeing real or not right which i think right. is actually good all of us getting like a healthy dose of skepticism about what we're seeing online is something that's probably overdue and we should be right. able to work out for ourselves hang on a minute i've seen this image i've had this response now i need to do some homework and check if this is real before i have a tantrum or run off or create mm. drama around it do I, i need i need to do my homework now and not believe mm. everything i see online that's a good thing to have anyway so i'm not worried right. about that either and then there's going to be tools and do you th- do yeah please please go on please please that i mean there's going to be tools that come up for photographers that are going to be very useful like mm-hmm. i mean i'll give an example that's just come up for me so i i just put out the i put out these magazines called parable at the moment which mm-hmm. is like photography and writing around a theme and i've just sent the second volume to the printers now which is about work i did uh, in namibia with the himba tribe and and some landscape stuff there and there mm-hmm. was i i realized that there were two shots in there that i love in that body of work but i had sent to compose those portraits right Mm-hmm. and i wanted them to be full page spreads in the magazine which meant that the seam went right down the middle of the face which you don't want right you don't want that seam of the magazine right down the center of the face so what right. i did was i moved the face over to one page and okay. but now i didn't have enough of that side of the image to fill over mm-hmm. and then i just selected the edge and i went generative mm-hmm. fill in photoshop beta and it went oh, okay. like this and it just filled it's just bokeh so it doesn't matter right. it's bokeh and blur but it's given me a little bit of extra background blur and texture that does fit pretty well that helps mm. me just recompose that portrait that I made. I'm not changing the portrait, I'm just extending right. that background in an intuitive way. Stuff like that for me as a photographer, that is a useful tool. Um right. so things like that I think it's going to it's going to it's going to be interesting. And mm. then when it comes to creating digital art, who cares, mm. right? I I I think as long as somebody says 
I made this on AI. Right. I, I mean, I, it's I, fine. show me something that's interesting. That's good enough on its own. But just don't lie about how you made it. Give right. the credit to the fact that you just punched in some some keywords and AI made it. You didn't, and then I'm fine mm. with it. Do whatever you like. Just be honest. And and a lot of photographers and a lot of uh, you know photography communities communities on Instagram are doing that. Like they're yeah. share, uh, sharing AI generated images and they are not even mentioning there. Well, that I mean that's that, an ethical think, issue, right? Right. I, I think you should be able. I think you should say where it comes from, mm -hmm. um, and if you don't say it outright, I think what would be a great idea. It's not my idea. A friend of mine, Jeffrey Sidoris, he 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 came up with this. He says like, what should happen is that baked into the metadata of every AI generated image is something that's clearly identifiable as where this thing was generated right. from AI. Because if it's in there and we can check, I don't care mm. how you make it. Just show me something interesting, but just right. be honest Ooh. about where it comes from. Mm -hmm. But what do you think? What exactly are the genres of photography that you think will really got impacted by AI? Especially, well, I mean, yeah. So the example I use in the video is is like my industry, my old industry product photography. Yeah, yeah. And and, and I'm talking from the commercial perspective, right? Yes. You can. So yeah. so, but that's but that's been a problem for a while. Like I basically had to move from product mm -hmm. photography to other sorts of photography, not because of AI, but because of CGI. Because okay. when I was doing product photography and photographing uh, furniture for homes, which was my job in London, um, mm. 2015 was the first year IKEA came out with a catalog of entirely CGI generated images. There wasn't a single actual photograph in there. And when you looked okay. at it, I was like, wow, this is beautiful. It's beautiful, beautiful stuff. I can't tell the difference as a photographer. It looks a thousand percent real to me and it looks mm. great and it shows the products off. So that for me was a moment where I went, ah, Photographers mm. are going to be less needed in this industry because it's going to switch over to CGI operators. They can do it cheaper. They don't need to hire locations and lighting and like make all these products. They can just do it with a guy sitting at a computer and make beautiful looking stuff. Now, I mm. can get angry about that. Like, my industry is going away. I have to change jobs. Or I can just go, well, technology develops. I have to sidestep now and try something else because this industry is going to switch over to this. And why shouldn't they? Like if they mm -hmm. they don't owe me as photographer as a photographer or they don't owe photography in general their loyalty, their company's mm -hmm. trying to sell sofas. They're always going right. to pick the best and cheapest option for them to produce marketing mm -hmm. material. They don't owe me anything. So I just had mm -hmm. to man up and go, okay, it's time to sidestep and go and do something different. So mm -hmm. a a AI will do similar things. Some photographers mm -hmm. will have to switch and it will be tough. And that sucks, by the way. Of course that sucks. That's hard for them. Right. And it, because it was hard for me, I know how you feel, but we can't hold progress back to keep jobs exactly the same forever. I mean, it's like right. it, it's like America knows this, right? Like, like everything's switching over to green energy, for example, and they're putting up wind turbines and solar power, and you've got mm. people in the Appalachians going like, "Yeah, but we're coal miners." Like, "Yeah, I'm sorry, but we can't keep doing things the old way to keep your job exactly the same because technology is right. progressing." So we have right. to move with it and adjust and adapt or we'll get left behind. That's just, I think, the way the world works. You know? mm -hmm. And do you think photographers will have to like expand their skill sets as well now? Because, you know, talking about you, 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 you create videos on YouTube mm -hmm. and you do all the other stuff as well. Same goes for me as well. But what mm -hmm. about those photographers who are solely like, uh, you know, uh, dependent on their photography to make money? Let's say a uh, uh, a hotel photographer for that matter, interior photographer for that matter, commercial yeah. photographer, product yeah. photographer. They are completely dependent on their skill set of photography. They are not yeah. creating videos or they are not writing books and they are not doing anything else. So the fear in them is like is at all times real. Yeah, it's real, uh, and and right. I I do feel for them, but I think the the, the hard truth is they're going to have to adapt. Mm -hmm. We 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 could I mean. Like a good, that's a good example. Hotels, isn't it? You could now get somebody in who sticks a a, a, a stick in the middle of a corridor and it scans right. the room, and right. then you can take that back and then you can change the light and you can do a night shot and a day shot and people in it, people out of it. Like they could do anything on a computer and it would look great. Right. A photographer, right. they can't afford a photographer being there for days taking just a handful of photographs. Ooh. It's moving on, and I think I think we have to we have to admit that it's moving on, and we have to adjust. And I'm not saying that as somebody who also hasn't had to adjust and had to switch right. careers. Like I know sure. how difficult that is. I'm not saying it lightly. It's a painful, difficult thing, but mm. I think I think we do have to adjust. Mm. 
they will come a barrage of like prompt photographers now yeah well well i mean yeah already you're gonna get attacked for calling them prompt photographers because they're like you know what I mean? like, can I do? <laughs> who gets the credit for ai it's not really the person who puts the prompt in it's the program it's 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 the example i heard was it's like going it's like me going into the city near me york and seeing like a street artist who's sketching and sit down and say draw me draw me the cathedral with me standing in front of it and he sits there and he draws the cathedral me going home going look what i made like you didn't make that the guy sitting on the street drew it and you took it you just right. told him what to draw so i think that's going to be an interesting thing as well how much credit from can you take from something mm. that's made by a program you can take mm. a tiny bit of credit for putting in some prompts but it's not your art you you didn't right. make you didn't make it you prompted something else to make it for you and there's a big difference mm -hmm. Right, right, right. So coming, I, I want to ask you about your book. Like, how did you, how did you thought of like writing, writing a book? Like, was the, was it a thing in your head from a very long time? You always wanted mm. to write a book. I, I, I was in Iceland in 2018, mm -hmm. and I was stuck in a, I was stuck in a cabin, uh, and uh, it was. A big storm outside for about two or three days a heavy heavy storm and i wanted to go out and take video and photos and stuff and i just couldn't so i took out my journal at the time and i was just sketching out this idea for if i wanted to take the philosophical videos i've been putting up on that youtube channel and expand them and throw a lot of my story into it and talk about other things in that vein that wouldn't work as videos what would i do and i just started writing down chapter ideas getting mm. a flow of what a book might look like Right. And then at the beginning of 2020 was when the publisher approached me and said, hey, do you want to do a book with us? And I said, well, I've already got this idea. And then mm. we signed a deal and we went straight into that first lockdown. So I had mm. seven months just to sit and write. So it was a perfect project to just work on from home for a few months right. and hammer out. And it feels good to sort of put something down about what I think and feel about creativity and life as this human being here now you know that mm -hmm. might live after i go you know it exists right. now in the world it, it's it's been a really kind of gratifying experience for me to sort of put out in the world you know mm. and like you say it's like creating order from chaos yeah yeah i mean I, that's how i feel about creativity is it's like us going the world is a tough difficult chaotic unpredictable place that we don't really have a handle on a lot of the time so when we right. make something i feel like it's us just creating a tiny bit of order like if we, if we take some clay on a wheel that's just a lump right and we start to shape it we're making it order we turn it into a vase we turn it into something that like looks a bit more ordered because it makes us feel like we maybe have a bit more of a handle on life than we probably do there's almost a lie in it funny enough because we don't true, really true, true. but there's like a comfort to it right like i can do something i can shape something i can make something i can say something right. and that right. makes us feel like we're not completely powerless against all this. Mm. And do you often think about the legacy that you want to leave behind? I, I have done more over the last few years, I think. And uh, I, I don't, maybe, it's, maybe it's a getting older thing, right? You just start And, to and, think, and do, do, you, do you think book happened because of that as well? Yeah, Same I think legacy. there's definitely a part of that in there. Yeah, it's like, what do I want to leave behind? If, I, if I'm gone next year, I want to have said something that I believe and have it exist i don't care what happens with it that's not my job like whether no right. one cares about it in a year or they're still reading it in 200 years is none of my business and i don't have any control over that but i, I did leave it. something it kind of feels good you know it kind of feels mm -hmm. like um just leaving something behind that exists is, is a nice thing right right so basically you do photography you have written a book as well you do zines as well mm -hmm. and you're into filmmaking so do you have any plans to like create films now I would love, love, love to make a documentary film one day, like a proper feature length documentary film. I mean, I'm a long have you, way have off. You, have, you th have you thought about it? Like, yeah. Give yeah. Me a thought of yeah. I mean, I even had an idea for a while that probably won't happen now because it's just the access is not the same. But I mean, it's definitely in my head that that would be a challenge I'd love to give myself. And that's kind of why on my channel at the moment, I'm doing lots of these documentaries with other photographers that are just 15, right. 20 minutes because it's a way for me to practice those skills of how do I capture a good interview and put some B-roll over it and tell a story. Right. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's a good exercise to work out, have I got the skills to do the longer form stuff? It's kind of right. almost like right. in the gym with documentaries and so you can come out and do the big thing one day. Mm -hmm. um, 
but yeah, I'd love to do it with people as well. I don't think I want to do it on my own. It'd be great to do it as part of a little crew that we work together on producing something. But it's a little dream right. I have, yeah. Mm, the first interview session that uh, the uh, that I've seen of yours was with photographer Fiona Lark. Oh so, yes, yeah, yeah. 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 That, that was, was that the was first video that I saw. People, yeah, yeah, which is a beautiful one. It's still one of my favorites. You know, she's mm. she's a very special person and photographer, and I think a lot of people connect with that. Right, 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 right. I think it's been more than an hour we were talking. Yeah, <laughs> it's all right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So. So in the end, I just want to ask you, what mm. are your like aspirations now? What what kind of work you want to do in the future? What exactly you want to do? Do you think about future at all or you are like mm. happy doing things or going through things the way they are? I can talk about it in the different spaces. So, I mean, like photography wise, I still feel like a very middling photographer. I've got a lot of work to do. Uh, I feel okay. to, to become a good photographer or to have something to say. My photography feels like it's flagging behind. I feel like my videos are better developed and my writing is better developed. So over the next while, I really want to work on that. And that's why the, the magazines are out because I that's my attempt to write and produce images that tell more deliberate stories. Um, so that exercise I'm really enjoying and I really want to dig in on that over the coming years as well uh, and teach myself and train myself how to do that with purpose. The videos will carry on. I've kind of backed them off to once a month and I really want to focus on the documentaries and produce more and more of those. So less tut tutorials, which mean my channel won't grow as much from now because it, that right. appeals to less beginners what I'm going to be doing, but I'll, I love that work. So that's mm -hmm. the work I want to keep making. Um, the stuff with a bit more depth and meaning to it. Um, right. And then, yeah, I mean, in terms of the book and stuff, I mean, it's it's out there doing its thing. It's been really nice to be going around at the moment and doing talks in different countries on the book and sort of getting those conversations going with people in real life. Like, I've really enjoyed that part of it. Um, mm. And then the long run, who knows? You know, I mean, I'm, do, I'm doing little things on the side now. Like, I've just basically taken myself back to school again and I'm studying to be a counselor or therapist mm. um, because I feel like maybe in my 50s, down the road away, no rush, that might be right. something that would be good to sort of do as well as as, as a way to help people and uh yeah because i did a psychology degree at university and just left it behind so to pick that back up and put that in the mix and even if i don't mm. end up there those are skills which are really really helpful on retreats and other things where i have one-to-one -one sessions with people so right beyond that i'm trying to stay loose and just to see what happens as i go lovely lovely mate i mean i just want to tell you one thing that you know your work has really inspired me a lot you know, okay. when I was going through a tough time, uh, you know, in my photography career as well, one video that I saw of yours was in, in that video, you were talking about why you should not care about the likes and, you know, engagement, mm -hmm. and you should stick to what you really want to do. Yeah. And I, re I really want to tell you that you're doing a fabulous job, you know, Thank at least, you, at least, at least I can vouch out for that because you have really literally inspired me. And uh. now, now, uh, getting inspired by you, I'm somehow trying to do the similar thing. Great. Uh, with my work and with my videos as well. Uh, I, I also, I, yeah, I also have a personal YouTube channel and yeah. I don't talk about gears and technical stuff mm. over there as well. I talk about movies and I talk about mm -hmm. different stuff and, you know, I, I, I create video essays or, 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 as well on movies. Yeah. And right. Yeah. I, yeah. I write poetry and all because of you, because I think Beautiful. wherever I can express my creativity or my imagination, I'm ready to do that. Yeah, I love that, man. I love hearing that. Thank you. That's very kind of you. It's very generous. It was yeah. lovely talking to you. It was lovely talking to you. And I would love if you could just create a documentary and, uh, <laughs> you know, coming to India as well. Hey, I would oh, love that, to... that would be cool. I, 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 I mean, India's high on my list. I really hope I can get over this soon. It'd be very, very cool. Yeah. Right. Looking forward to it, mate. Looking forward cool. to it. Thank you. It was lovely talking to you. Yeah, it's great and talking to you, man. Thanks for the invite. It's very you. nice. To I, you. I hope you like the conversation. Thank you. Yeah, it was great. Thank you. Really enjoyed it. Right. Take care, mate. Bye-bye. Take care. Cheers, man. Bye. Bye. Thank you.